It is with great pleasure that I introduce our first speakers, Fiona McCormack and Zoe Barand from the TGA. Fiona is based in Brisbane and is the Principal Technical Advisor within the Medical Devices Authorization Branch. She has over 14 years experience at the TGA across various classes of medical device, including diagnostics, and more recently, personal protective equipment for COVID-19. Zoe is based in Brisbane and is a Senior Medical Device Auditor and MD SAP Assessor within the Devices Quality Audits and Assessment section of the Medical Devices Surveillance Branch. She has over five years experience at the TGA following employment with high-risk sterile medical device manufacturers. The Therapeutic Goods Association, or TGA, is part of the Australian Government Department of Health and is responsible for regulating therapeutic goods, including prescription medicines, vaccines, sunscreens, vitamins, minerals, medical devices, and blood and blood products. Almost any product for which a therapeutic claim are made must be entered onto the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods, or the ARTG, before it can be supplied in Australia. Thanks so much, Fiona and Zoe. Hi, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, so I'll just thank you, Shay, for handing over. And I'd just like to uh, reiterate Shay's comments that the information that we're going to discuss today is general in nature and it is um, advice. And one of our main goals today is to help you understand what your obligations are in relation to the therapeutic goods legislation. So if you do need to seek any independent advice or information after the presentation, then please follow up after that. So as we all know that COVID-19 was declared a, a pandemic early in, early in January this year, or as, a, as an organism of interest initially before it became a pandemic, and Australia had its first case late January. So we've had um, a large increase and it's attracted a lot of interest from new businesses who are looking to break into the, into the medical and the health fields. And to give you an indication of the, the kind of increase in activity we've had um, in the TGA space, we've had over 1,500 new organisations contact the TGA to become new sponsors. And we've processed more than 2,000 applications or PPE and other medical devices associated with, with COVID. Um, in the medical devices area, we've had more than a thousand inquiries relating to hand sanitizer. And just one point, med, um, hand sanitizers are actually not regulated as medical devices. Those are over-the-counter medicines, so we won't be covering any of those today. And also, because there's been a large increase in activity, we've needed to issue a number of infringement notices, mainly relating to advertising breaches associated with COVID. So the TGA is continuing to prioritise and expedite all of the applications we receive, seeking regulatory approval to manufacture, import and supply devices for the prevention, detection and treatment of COVID-19. So we've put in place a number of exemption pathways and some of those pathways have conditions um, associated with them just to improve the access and, and make devices immediately available without putting any limitations on those supply. So we are still conducting full regulatory assessments. And in the case of where we've got um, new devices which don't have a long regulatory history, some of those approvals have been granted with conditions based on the information that's available. And part of the TGA's role is to continue to monitor the performance of those devices. So there's been a lot of information emerging all the way through. So the TGA's website is really the first port of call for where you need to go for up-to-date information. And today we want to make sure that um, we're, we're supplying information to um, manufacturers and sponsors who have not interacted with the TGA before and are unfamiliar with some of the processes. So this is really like starting level information. So 
If you're considering manufacturing, supplying, advertising, importing or exporting any product to help test for, prevent or to treat COVID-19, then you're a potential sponsor of a therapeutic good. And there's certain requirements that you need to meet under the legislation. The market authorization is required in Australia before you can supply a therapeutic good. And that's even if you are also the manufacturer of that device. So there are two separate steps and there are penalties which may apply if you don't meet the requirements. So if we start off first of all with what is a medical device? So there is a legislated definition in the Therapeutic Goods Act, but it is essentially a product that's used for diagnosis, prevention, monitoring, treatment, alleviation of disease, injury or disability, or it's a product used for the investigation, replacement or modification of the anatomy or of a physiological process, or for the control of conception. So medical devices don't achieve their primary function through pharmacological, immunological or metabolic means. Those are um, regulated in the medicine space. And an accessory to a medical device can also be a medical device. So if we narrow that down a little bit more into personal protective equipment or PPE, such as face masks, these are designed to protect the wearer from injury or to prevent the spread of infection or illness. And the presentation or the claims that you make relating to your face mask really determine how that face mask is regulated. So it can either be a therapeutic good or it's a consumer product. So if you have a PPE that are excluded from regulation as a therapeutic good and are therefore considered consumer products, include those that are non-sterile, they're designed as safety or protective apparel. And that's really important. So that's that safety aspect. And they don't claim to be used um, in surgical or medical environments or for therapeutic purposes. Okay, so those are the consumer products. On the flip side of that, PPE that are regulated as therapeutic goods are those that carry um, claims around therapeutic use. They're labelled for use in a clinical or a surgical environment, or they carry claims that um, they're to reduce or prevent the transmission of disease or microorganisms such as bacteria or viruses. So if your face mask is considered a therapeutic good, because of the claims that you've got associated um, with it. It's regulated either, either as a class one medical device if it's not supplied sterile. If it is supplied sterile, it's called a class one sterile device. And sterile devices have some additional requirements where they have to have manufacturer's evidence to, to demonstrate that the sterility aspects of those devices have been met. So really the, the regulatory requirements for devices, are, it all pivots around the classification of the, of the device. So we regulate devices in Australia as a, as a kind of device. So the products are included in the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods or the ARTG as a kind of device. And this is a really legislated term and it's, it's quite a regulatory concept. So a device is taken to be the same kind of device as another device if it has the same manufacturer, same sponsor, same risk classification and the same global medical device nomenclature code. So the GMDN code is like a generic descriptor that allows us to consistently identify devices. So when you have an inclusion in the ARTG, provided you satisfy all of those four criteria, you can have multiple products under a single ARTG entry. Now, the manufacturer of a device is the person, and again, this is a legislated definition. So it's the person who takes responsibility for the design, production, packaging, and labeling of the device before it's supplied. So there's a number of steps in, in manufacturing. So the person who takes that responsibility for assembly, packaging, processing the device or if they refurbish the device, um, if they take out steps in labelling a device or assigning its intended purpose. Those are all manufacturer responsibilities. 
manufacturer is also responsible for assigning the risk classification and the intended purpose. And remember, it's the intended purpose of the device that determines what the classification is. Manufacturer assigns the GMDN term, and then they select and apply the appropriate conformity assessment procedures to demonstrate compliance with the essential principles. And we're going to talk about these essential principles in a little bit more detail um, shortly. So for sponsors, so the sponsor is a person who imports or arranges the importation of devices into Australia or they export them from Australia. And if within Australia, the sponsor is, can also be the person who manufactures the goods or arranges them to be manufactured um, by another person for supply. So where we have goods that are, spon uh, that are manufactured in Australia, often the manufacturer is also the sponsor. And for low risk devices, we find that that frequently occurs. So there are responsibilities as a manufacturer. And if you're also supplying them, you also have to fulfill those responsibilities as a sponsor. So um, some of those responsibilities include if you are if the sponsor is not the same person as the manufacturer, you need to have procedures in place so that you can actually get information from the manufacturer of your PPE before you supply them. If there's any conformity assessment evidence that needs to be submitted, that's the sponsor's responsibility. And the sponsor needs to apply for inclusion in the ARTG. So that's the market authorization process. And when you lodge an application for inclusion in the ARTG, you also certify that the information you're providing is complete and correct. And correct. There's an assessment, I'm sorry, an application fee to pay, and any documentation that the TGA requests needs to be submitted. If we ask for any samples, the TGA may um, choose to undertake some testing of devices, they need to be provided. And the TGA can also enter any manufacturing premises, both inside Australia or outside of Australia. And the sponsor also has some post market responsibilities around maintaining records of dis distribution and, and knowing where they're supplying their products to. Yeah, so we have um, some general regulatory requirements and depending on the, on the class of the therapeutic goods, we have um, different regulatory guidelines. So for medical devices, we have the ARG and then the Australian Regulatory Guidelines for Medical Devices. And this information is available on the TGA website. We have an assessment process that manufacturers need to go through for medical devices called conformity assessment. And this is really um, how the manufacturer demonstrates compliance with those essential principles. So there's pre-market evaluation. And TGA applies a risk-based approach. So for really high risk devices, there's quite a series of detailed steps that the manufacturer has to go through. But for low risk devices like PPE, the, the conformity assessment requirements are, are, are very low and it mainly revolves around the manufacturer undertaking a self-assessment process to make sure that they meet the requirements before they apply to supply them in Australia. So the conformity assessment procedures for class one non-sterile PPE um, are broken down into three steps. So the whole, the whole goal for us is to ensure that the manufacturer demonstrates compliance with the essential principles. And those essential principles, or we, we refer, refer to them as the EPs, um, it's a set of criteria for making sure that the, the device is safe and it performs as intended. There's three aspects of the, of the conformity assessment procedure. So the manufacturer needs to have a technical file in place. They need to have post-market monitoring um, system in place and they need to be able to um, make a declaration of conformity under the Australian legislation. So we're gonna talk about the technical file and the contents of the technical file in a little bit more detail. So this is the manufacturer's responsibility to actually comply, compile the technical information. And it includes information such as the names and the models of any PPE that they're manufacturing, 
description of them, the details of the design and any drawings of the device, information about the materials that the device is made from. And the, the essential principles require the manufacturer to systematically go through a set of criteria and, and get the manufacturer to consider how they meet those requirements. So we want to ensure that the device has been designed and manufactured in a way that ensures it's, as, it's safe and it performs as intended. And that any risks that are identified with the device have been mitigated to the extent possible. So these are things like um, making sure that there are no contaminants or residues in any of the materials that you're using. Um, so manufacturing residuals, or if you do have a device that you are supplying sterile, um, sterilization residues such as ethylene oxide. So making sure that the manufacturer is considered um, for some of the materials that you're using that um, I've just seen in, in the UK, they've had a recall um, just it came out in the last few days where the foam that they're using over the nose piece of the respirator has been breaking down and that creates a risk of inhalation for these fragments to the user. So it's really making sure that the, the materials that you're using is safe and that they will last. They're not affected by transport or storage. So the elastic bands aren't going to break down before the expiry date on, on the product. Now, a lot of the technical requirements that are specific to PPE are generally well covered in medical device standards. And there are a number of standards that are relevant to PPE. Now, it's not compliance with specific standards is not mandatory. So it's not a requirement, but it is one of the easiest ways to demonstrate compliance with the essential principles because it sets out the requirements for technical testing or any investigations that the manufacturer has to meet. So if you choose to apply the requirements of a standard and you demonstrate that you meet that standard, then you can satisfy the requirements of the essential principles. If you choose to go with a, diff a different route for demonstrating compliance, then you need to be able to justify that the, the processes you've applied are what we consider state of the art. But you can't, you can't apply a, a lower standard, which is why even though those standards are not mandatory, it's useful. And the standards on the TGA website under the COVID section, you can go and we actually have a list of all of the standards that are available for um, face masks and respirators. And they include the things like the particulate and um, filtration requirements for atmospheric filtration, or if you've got surgical face masks, the requirements around um, fluid penetration or, or blood splatter, if you like. So there is different standards for the different requirements. Um, components of the technical file, we also require the manufacturer to have information about the post-market monitoring system. So there needs to be a systematic review of the product to make sure that it's continuing to comply with the requirements. The manufacturer needs to have processes in place for undertaking any corrective action. And if something goes wrong um, with the device, that they are aware of their responsibilities for reporting of adverse events. So for class one non-sterile devices, the manufacturer has gone through the the list of essential principles and they, they're satisfied that they've met those requirements. They then do a self-assessment process and they make an Australian declaration that all of those requirements have been met. And that's the point when the manufacturer, and if they're also acting as the sponsor in Australia or if they're assigning that responsibility to somebody else, applies for market authorization. And that's really a checkpoint for manufacturers to confirm is my PPE a therapeutic good? Do I meet the definition of a medical device? Or do I have a consumer product? Um, if you are a therapeutic good, what is the classification of my device? So there's a, there's a really good classification tool on the TGA website under the SME Assist section, which is a section for new manufacturers. And it goes through a series of decision steps that help help manufacturers classify the devices. There are some really specific labeling requirements that need to be met. Um, 
Essential Principle 13 covers the labelling requirements. And there's also a requirement for the sponsor to information to be identified on the labelling of the device. So that if something goes wrong, the user knows who to contact in Australia with the problem. When you're submitting if, um, your applications, you need an online account through the TGA Business Services, which is a secure online portal. And if you are applying for devices above class one, then you need to have manufacturer's evidence or the evidence of your conformity assessment procedures um, submitted and approved before you can actually launch that ARTG application. Now, there is, I mentioned earlier on that we put in place a number of exemptions at the start of the pandemic. And one of those exemptions is um, for face masks and, and other articles. And this one was aimed at procurement of goods for the national medical stockpile to make sure that the Australian government still can maintain supplies of critical medical equipment. So that exemption has been confusing for, for some sponsors in particular because it's only relevant, we've got conditions on it that make it only relevant to the importation, exportation or manufacture of PPE by a person who already has an established contract with the Department of Health. So you can't import goods into Australia and then supply them directly to hospitals. That exemption is only allowing for supply directly into the national medical stockpile, and then those goods are then distributed out to the, to the areas that, are, that need them. And that exemption's in place until the end of January next year. So the TGA's role is to continually monitor and evaluate the, the goods once they're on the market. And for sponsors and manufacturers, getting the product onto the ARTG is just the first step. So they need to maintain um, evidence and keep up to date their technical file to, to be able to produce documentation to demonstrate that they meet the requirements for safety and performance. And the TGA um, will continue to monitor this. We've got some powers under our legislation that allow us to ask questions of manufacturers and sponsors about the product that they're supplying. Um, we can seize products and ins inspect um, manufacturing facilities if, if required. And if there are some problems that arise or if there's um, any risk of, of serious injury or death, then we can immediately cancel the, the supply of those products. Or if, if the sponsor, if we ask for information relating to those devices and that information isn't provided to us, then we have grounds to cancel the, the ARTG inclusion. And if there are problems with it, we can also mandate a recall. Okay, and that's, there's, a, there's a specific process for recall of therapeutic goods called the Uniform Recall Procedure for Therapeutic Goods. Now, because there's been a rapid increase in, in devices relating to COVID just in the last six months or so, um, a number of concerns have been raised around um, the quality and the safety of some of those devices, particularly in devices that have been imported. And questions have been raised around whether they meet the definition of a therapeutic good and whether they meet the definition of a device or not. And whether they should be included in the ARTG. So that's some of those consumer products that, that don't carry those therapeutic claims. And if they do meet the definition of a therapeutic good, does the manufacturer and subsequently the sponsor have the information and that documentation to support the safety and the performance of those goods? So the TGA is undertaking a systematic review of the, the PPE that are included in the ARTG to, to call in the, the information to support those devices. Okay, so a number of manufacturers have already been contacted and the sponsors of those goods. And yes, there have been a number of cancellations, more than 200. A large number of um, sponsors have, have indicated and it's, it's been a, um, a self-directed uh, cancellation because they've essentially said to us, we're not supplying those anymore. We imported them at the start of the pandemic, we've sold them, we've got no more. So it's a, it's a self-directed cancellation. And there have been some medical device or some PPE that has been determined not to be medical devices and they've also been cancelled. 
So I've touched on a lot of um, areas that are quite high level. There's, there's a lot of information on the TGA website and the SME Assist section of the TGA website is, is really helpful for, um, for those that are not familiar with the regulatory process. And there's a number of avenues that you can go through um, to assist um, if you need some additional information. And there's some further links through here. And that's it for us. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Fiona. That was a really great overview. And just to reiterate, um, all presentations will be available and made public after the webinar. So there's a lot of really handy links in that, in that presentation uh, that would be great for, for everybody to access. Um, you finished spot on time as well. So we've, we've just got a few specific um, TGA questions that we might just run through quickly while we're here. Um, so Fiona and Zoe, we've got a question from Peter asking, is an air filtration device that filters for microbes a medical device that is regulated by the TGA? So the standard that um, covers um, respiratory protective devices, so that's ASNZS 1716, sets out the requirements for particulate filtration. So that is not a medical device standard. But if a manufacturer applies that standard and they have a P2 respirator and they're making claims as a P2 respirator, that is appropriate to use in a medical setting. But if there are no specific claims about it being used in a clinical or a medical environment or a clinical setting, um, they're not representing it to be used um, by medical professionals, then it doesn't have therapeutic claims. So it really is very specific around the intended use. If you've got a, a picture of a doctor on the, on the label and a, a stethoscope, then you're representing it to be a clinical clinical use. So if you've applied that, that respiratory or the respirator standard and you've said I've got a P2 respirator and you've represented it for the use in a clinical setting, then yes, it's a therapeutic good. However, if you've just said this is a protective device and um, it's for protection of the user from particulate filtration, you're not making any medical claims around um, protection from viruses or protection from bacteria, it's not a therapeutic good. Thanks so much, Fiona, that's great. Just another question from Daniel. Does the provision of a therapeutic good, a mask or a glove, during the pandemic to hospitals being a sponsor allow the importer to access the TGA annual charge exemption scheme? Not, not necessarily. So there are some criteria around the, the annual charge exemption around turnover of um, so each, each application that you make for, a, for an annual charge exemption um, is decided um, case by case. So that there's actually a process that you can apply for, for an exemption. Excellent, thank you. And just one more question. Um, this is from Faz. I'm just gonna try and um, describe this easily. So I think what they're getting at is that overseas, um, in order to get a CE mark or 13485 approval, um, the, the cost for annual audits overseas is a lot lower than in Australia. And the cost for a sponsor to import the goods is lower um, than it is for a manufacturer in Australia. Um, can the TGA support Australian manufacturing by making it a level playing field? So they're talking a lot about the cost of audits overseas versus the cost of, like the cost of compliance here versus the cost of compliance overseas and what can we do to make it a, a level playing field? I'm not sure if that's a question you can answer, but maybe on the class one side, um, describing the process, whether or not you need ISO 13485, or you don't need CE marking to spy in Australia. But. I can because I am from the conformity assessment area. Okay, so we have we have a process in Australia where we actually for low risk devices that require manufacturer's evidence, we accept um, reg, um, conformity assessment evidence that's been issued by comparable overseas regulators. So when we have a CE marking on a device, 
uh, provided it's not a high risk device, in general, that can be used as manufacturer's evidence to support your application for inclusion in the AR3G. Now, if we're talking specifically about PPE, which are class one non-sterile, you do not need to have any formal conformity assessment evidence. So you don't need an ISO 13485 certificate to import or manufacture class one non-sterile devices in Australia. Okay, so they're, they're exempt from that requirement. The manufacturer is still, it's helpful if they have um, elements of a quality system in place, but they don't need that formal evidence. Excellent, thanks Fiona. And just one last question before we move on to the next speaker. Uh, this is a question, a, a disinfectant related question. So we haven't really been focusing on this today, but the, Brian is just wondering if we're able to provide comment on TGO 54, which is disinfectant related. Um, it's something that they've been actively wrestling with as an Australian manufacturer. So I'm not sure if you can comment on that or not. Disinfectants are regulated as other therapeutic goods in, in under our legislation, so they are not medical devices unless they are used to uh, disinfect another medical device than they are. So there is a, a fairly detailed section. I could talk for an hour about disinfectants, but I'm sure you don't want to hear it. Um, if you've got some specific questions, otherwise, what I would recommend if you are grappling with um, some of the disinfectant related information, send it an email to the devices inbox. So it's devices at tga.gov.au and if you ask a specific question they'll get back to you within a day or two. Wonderful thank you so much Fiona and Zoe and we're very appreciative to have you here today I think we're all very lucky to hear directly from the TGA about some of those requirements. So next up we have Michelle Knight. Michelle is the clinical and regulatory manager at Hydrix where she leads regulatory and clinical consulting projects for their clients. As a certified professional with the Association of Clinical Research Professionals, Michelle is an experienced clinical program manager and specializes in identifying the scope and requirements of clinical evidence to support global regulatory, marketing and reimbursement needs of Hydrix clients. As a qualified audiologist, Michelle draws on her significant professional experience in the area of patient-related safety and effectiveness, of active implantable medical devices to provide evidence-based outcomes for medical device manufacturers. Michelle started working in 1995 as a research audiologist at the Bionic Ear Institute under Professor Graham Clark, the inventor of the first multi-channel cochlear implant. In addition, Michelle's previous research is published in peer-reviewed journals with over 400 citations and 2,700 reads. Hydrix is a specialist product development and engineering company based in Melbourne with a focus on in the cardiac, medtech, connected technologies, mining and industrial markets. They utilize their unique offering of clinical, regulatory and quality systems expertise combined with their complete in-house product development capabilities to support clients along the entire development journey from blank sheet of paper to product distribution. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you very much, Shay. Uh, and welcome from COVID Central, uh, given that I'm based here in Melbourne. Uh, so we're all thrilled to see the interest uh, in manufacturing PPE, because heaven knows we need it here. So what I'd like to talk about today is particular uh, tips for organisations who wish to manufacture non-sterile face masks. I just want to check, you can see my screen? So I'm No, not, not your screen, Michelle, we can just see your face. Okay, let me just back a moment. Share my screen. Yes, there we go. Okay, there we go. We're good. So what I'd like to give you today is some really practical advice on the major hurdles and common mistakes that we see organisations making when they're wanting to develop and design 
uh, specifically face masks uh, in today's discussion. I split this, uh, this presentation up into three sections, three sections, five sections, where they're really key milestones along uh, the device development pathway. And if you miss one milestone, it, it can be really difficult to um, reel that back in at a later stage. And I'll talk to, to each of these in detail. So early feasibility, what are we talking about here? Really important to understand your user needs. Who's going to use the mask? Does it have a particular performance level that's required? And we know that masks have three different performance levels based on uh, their fluid uh, ingress or fluid resistance protection. Will one size fit all? Gone are the days where we would only be using masks strictly within the medical environment. We're now going to, particularly in Victoria, use masks whenever we go outside. So something that might be comfortable for just a short period of time may not be comfortable for medical professionals who are now having to use the mask at all times during their shift. Is there going to be any kind of skin irritation um, caused by this protracted use of masks for medical professionals. Is reprocessing likely? And we're seeing that definitely in, in places like the US and Europe, where there is such a limited supply of face masks that medical professionals are, are having to turn to um, reprocessing. And that's really important to understand very, very early on and define these design drivers because it provides a tangible example of the ultimate aim of the product. It also helps that, that as products are developed, there's often scope creep and it's really an important way of being able to pull the team back into, no, this is the defined scope. We don't want to go off on that tangent. And it, it helps uh, structure the conversation around the nuances of what's required for this particular product. And then finally, sustainability. We don't want face masks to become the new uh, polystyrene coffee cups of 2020. But considering that, we also need to make sure that the masks uh, provide the required level of protection, performance and safety. So these are all really key issues to consider early in your design process, rather than rushing to, oh, well, I'm just going to make a face mask. So concept ideation is something uh, that we take our clients through at Hydrix. And we do it in a, in a formal way through a concept selection process by identifying the requirements of your mask, the user needs, uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, we then can rate, the, it then becomes a trade-off matrix. Is the cost of goods for a particular market more important than the performance or the ease of manufacturer or sustainability? If so, then it gets rated with a higher number. If sustainability in a different market is the key driver, along with performance, then it's rated more highly. So that the row for sustainability is rated more highly against each of the columns here. This then enables uh, organisations to really clearly understand what are the performance drivers, what are the the design drivers that are required for a key market and therefore you're more likely to actually produce a product that meets your user needs and to do this as early as possible in the design process rather than later on doing it and trying to back the process up. It's very difficult, very costly and time consuming to do and you may end up with a product that simply doesn't meet the user needs for your market. 
So we recommend that organisations who wish to manufacture non-sterile masks really follow the medical device development process. By following a formalised process, it ensures that the regulatory requirements that have been discussed earlier today are met at all stages of the product development cycle. It's very, very difficult to suddenly think, oh, I need to create my technical file once I've actually already uh, shifted to design transfer. It, it, it's almost impossible. It can become such a, a burden and, and such a costly uh, and, and time inefficient way of doing things. But equally important, it's important to keep engaging with your stakeholders during your development, each stage of your development process. That helps mitigate risks that you have developed your product and missed your user needs, missed your key design drivers. So I, I encourage organisations to keep checking in and, and follow a, a user focused or a user centric development process. Show prototypes, check, keep checking back in with key stakeholders. Is this really still on target for what you were thinking? Because often key stakeholders don't know what they want until they see what they don't. And if you haven't checked in with them until we're at stage five, it's really, really difficult again to wind that process back. I'd like to talk about manufacturing here. These are some, some practical advice to avoid common mistakes that we've seen. The first of all is to engage the domain experts early. Uh, it, it's important to engage external manufacturers, vendors as early as possible, because that way your design can benefit from their experience and advice. Sooner or later, your, de your device or your design is going to be transferred to the manufacturer. And if they can't manufacture it because the, the device doesn't meet, meet their process, or their capabilities or their expertise, then it will incur a schedule delay at best and a redesign and cost at worst. It's also really important to incorporate manufacturing into the design as early as possible. What is this product made of? Is, are the materials that are used in the production of this product readily available? It's very, very, easy for design teams to uh, quickly jump into meeting design goals rather than considering um, manufacturability. How easy is this thing going to be to manufacture? It might have a wonderful design, but if you can't manufacture it, you're a bit stuck. Accounting for revisions is another thing. There's always a level of changes that occur when transitioning to a high volume production in the design transfer stage. But for things that are seemingly simple to fix, such as cosmetic finishes or branding or label revisions, they all take time and can impact your schedule and cost. Likewise, assembly changes. Assembly processes are often tied with the, des the device itself and it can take different forms depending on the device specifications and the volume. So you really want to consider this uh, in your device design. And finally, unrealistic and pressed timelines. I myself in clinical trials have grappled with this, where if you are uh, communicating to key stakeholders a 10% or a target date where you're at best likely, you know, with everything going well, you're likely to meet that timeline. It's very, very difficult you end up with, with cross stakeholders when suddenly the time has blown out because you've actually presented a timeline where absolutely everything had to go right in order to meet it. You, you, it's 
you're always better to report your 50% timeline or even a 90% timeline, particularly if you are new to manufacturing yourself. And then the final thing that I wanted to talk about is export certification. Great, you've designed your product, you've got a manufacturer who can ramp up into a high volume manufacturer of, of your product, but you want to be able to export. So then there's two pathways that you can, you can look at there. You can apply for either an export only certificate where the device isn't included in the ARTG, but it is used only to export to key markets who have their own requirements. Or you could have a certificate of free sale, which is for products that do have a current ART inclusion that allows for supply and sale within Australia. Uh, and you also wish to export these products. Sorry, working from home. <laughs> Sorry, we've managed to keep the dog quiet. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. That's all that I had today. Um, certainly, if there's any questions, let me know. Thanks, Michelle. That's absolutely fabulous. And it's uh, music to my ears hearing about design for manufacturer and manufacturability. And I just wanted to also emphasise one of the points that you made about the design control process. It's one thing that can be quite challenging when transitioning from a 9001 manufacturer to, to one that follows um, the methodologies of 13485. And having a really good understanding of what that design process looks like and the five steps that Michelle outlined and embedding those into your process will really stop you from having problems at the, at the back end when you're transferring to manufacturing and then subsequently scale up. So that's really, really good advice, um, Michelle. And thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Um, again, if we can just pop questions into the Q&A session, we might just move on to, to our next speaker, Cham, and then we will have the rest of the questions in the panel session. Cham Kanara is the General Man Manager for ClickSmart and is actively involved in all aspects of the company, including R&D, quality assurance, and business development. In her current role, she's responsible for the administration and maintenance of ClickSmart's ISO 13485 quality management system, which is also compliant with the US FDA, the Australian TGA, and the European Council regulations. In addition, she works with contract manufacturers and suppliers to achieve compliance to relevant medical device regulations. Cham received her doctorate in biotechnology from the University of Queensland and her bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering from the National University in Singapore. She holds diplomas in financial management and business administration, and she's also completed 13485 lead auditor training. ClickSmart is a 13485 accredited R&D and manufacturing company established in 1999. They specialize in medical devices. ClickSmart devices are now supplied to over 50 countries via a global distribution network of 120 partners. ClickSmart partners with or provides services to Australian companies looking to meet good manufacturing practices, GMP, or ISO 13485 quality management system certification and other medical device regulations. Their technical team has experience with translating existing manufacturing and quality assurance processes implementing medical device regulations and securing free market approvals in Australia, the US and Europe, and facilitating R&D consultation as required to translate existing manufacturing processes or products. Welcome, Cham. Thank you very much, Shay. I'm just gonna try to share my screen. So um, let me start by thanking Claire and her team at LSQ, Andrew and the team at MTP Connect, and Mark, Sue, and Sally from the Department of State Development for organizing this webinar. ClickSmart being from Brisbane, uh, we have first-hand experience of the support LSQ 
MTP Connect and the State Department gives to local companies uh, like us. And this is one more such initiative. Whether it's working with our contract manufacturers, as she mentioned, who often have not produced medical devices previous to working with us, or more recently with the work we have been doing with local manufacturers who are uh, responding to the COVID-19 supply deficits. The two questions we get asked most often is how does one start to meet medical device quality requirements and what is the process involved? As you could see from the presentations today, there is no doubt that it is complicated. However, my aim is to break this complicated process to a step-by-step -step guide. Towards the end of the presentation, I'll also quickly give you an overview of the differences between ISO 13485 versus ISO 9001 and also other commercial benefits of being a TGA listed manufacturer and having ISO certifications. So, how does one start? As Fiona mentioned in her presentation, as a first step, it is important to clearly understand what are the responsibilities of a legal manufacturer. A legal manufacturer is responsible for the entire life cycle of a medical device, including aspects like identifying the intended use of the device, all the way to packaging and labeling. And once the device is in the market, monitoring how the device performs as part of the post-market surveillance responsibilities. Similarly, at this stage, you also have to look into where your company is currently at. Often it is one of the three options that are listed here, which is a manufacturer with no documented operational procedures. Usually this is someone starting out new or taking on a new aspect of the manufacturing process or you may have some documented procedures and work processes, but the system itself is not certified. And lastly, you have a certified quality management system often to ISO 9001 standard, but the scope does not cover all aspects of the manufacturing process or the products. For example, we recently did some work with a manufacturer whose ISO 9001 scope covers only injection molded plastic components, and they are wanting to first expand their scope to cover assembly, packaging, and distribution of their products in the certification, and to not only cover plastic components, but medical devices as well. The next step is to understand where you would like to be at the end of this process. So if you are producing a class one device that is not sterile, you have to meet TGA requirements for both product and process conformity in your quality management system. For instance, do you have the processes within your company to set up and maintain technical files for the medical devices you are intending to place on the market? Or as with the example of the manufacturer I mentioned before, you may be aiming to expand your current ISO 9001 certification scope and meet TGA requirements. And finally, you may want to take it a step further and go for ISO 13485 certification for medical devices while also meeting TGA requirements. When deciding this ideal endpoint, there are a number of things to consider. First and foremost, the regulatory requirements as a medical device. This often depends on the classification of the medical device and the risk-based approach that Fiona mentioned as well. Secondly, is this something you'll be looking to do in the short term, especially given the current COVID-19 circumstances? Or is this a long-term strategic move for the company to move into manufacture of medical devices? This will then tie back into the amount of resources, whether it's financial, whether it's human resources you have for this project. You also have to identify your target market. Are you looking to supply only within Australia or supply internationally? And again, for example, TGA does not require quality management system certifications such, such as to an ISO standard for class one non-sterile medical devices. But having that ISO certification may help fast track market entry in another country. And finally, what type of timeline you are looking at for this implementation. So these are some of the factors you will have to weigh in and balance before making this decision for the company. 
now that we have look, identified the current status and the end point, let's jump into implementation. As part of implementation, the first step is to conduct a gap audit to identify the missing links between where you are currently at and where you would like to be. Gap audits like this usually have two aspects. One is a first party audit, which looks into the gaps within the company itself. And then a second party audit where you look at the gaps within your supply chain. Based on our experience, the gap audit may require external assistance and expert expertise to do it comprehensively, especially because it might be more time consuming to get your internal teams ready to be able to conduct the audit. Also, often it is more costly to rectify later if you miss any gaps at this stage. We usually find that gap audits are also an excellent training opportunity for the teams that we work with. The audit should be done in a way where you look at the gaps within the processes as well as the current documentation and the collective know-how within the company. As part of this process, it's really key to emphasize to the auditors, whether it's external or internal, to identify the know-how within your company and the knowledge gaps. Because this will help you to decide whether you need external support for implementation, which is the next step, or whether you can achieve implementation with your existing team. If you are conducting the audit internally, ISO 19011 standard will provide information on how to establish an audit program. So once the gap audit is done, the next step is to sit down with your internal teams to map the existing practices as they currently are. So a very good example that I often see is in regards to order processing. So if you go to a contract manufacturer or during consultancy, we will sit down with the order processing team to explain to us how they handle orders and ask them to help us understand what their day-to-day -day practices are. And what we find more often than not is there are work pra practices in place to make sure that there are no order mix-ups or you can trace where an order went when a customer calls and asks for the details. So by documenting these existing work practices and habits, you may be able to address some of the gaps identified during the audit. This also makes it a very interactive and an eye-opening process where you get the teams involved. There are also gaps that may not be addressed by work practices such as post-market surveillance activities, especially in the areas of capturing customer satisfaction and reporting responsibilities that require to be documented. So you will go through a process of updating or creating procedures to meet the gaps identified. Once that is done, you can conduct a review or an audit to ensure that all the gaps that were initially identified has been addressed. And then you can move on to providing training to the team on the updated processes and documentation. We find that training is key to making sure that your team is ready for these updated new procedures and practices. So it is important you look for qualified trainers as well. Once the training is done, you're now pretty much ready for a third party audit, which is either by a regulatory body or an ISO certification body, or in the case of class one non-sterile devices, you are now ready for your regulatory filings. Finally, you have to ensure ongoing compliance and this requires your quality team to work closely with other teams in your com company on an ongoing basis. We also want to share with you some of our experiences on what we have identified as critical factors that influence a successful implementation. Implementing and maintaining a successful quality management system really need ongoing management commitment and support. So it is critical that the management recognize the benefits of an implemented quality management system, not just for the sake of regulatory requirements and provide the resources required. We also encourage engagement with different teams as early as possible. We have always found that manufacturing a high quality product, that is a medical device, is something that manufacturing teams are really proud of 
and it is good to engage early and share the importance of their role in this process. Then when you are to map existing processes, work with the teams to identify work practices and habits, and when implementing new systems, try to make them practical and simple. Last thing you want is a process that is too complicated and one that nobody uses. Process gaps and non-conformity should always be used as a way of continuous improvement and spending the resources on root cause analysis will make sure that the systematic issues are identified and solved and there are long-term improvements. And there are a number of tools available to conduct an in-depth root cause analysis. Medical device regulations and ISO standards also change and evolve over time. So it is important to provide opportunities for ongoing training for internal teams to make sure what you have implemented is maintained. And finally, if you are engaging external expertise, look to see whether they have prior knowledge in the industry that you are working in, because that practical industry knowledge makes a big difference. Now that we have covered the process of of implementation, I will also quickly touch on the differences between ISO 9001 and ISO 13485. In simple terms, ISO 9001 is the overarching standard to implement a quality management system, regardless of the product, whereas the ISO 13485 standard is designed for the medical devices industry with alignment to a number of global medical device regulations. Given the time we have today, um, I have listed the key provisions that are different in ISO 13485 standard in comparison to ISO 9001 with reference to relevant sections. If you already have ISO 9001 certification and looking to move into ISO 13485 certifications, pay special attention to the key differences highlighted. Most of them are around the regulatory requirements. And if this is an area you have questions, we can discuss more during the panel session later as well. And while it may appear to be quite complicated, there are also a number of other commercial benefits of having a compliant quality management system or being a TGA listed legal manufacturer. Firstly, you're recognized by the different stakeholders and especially the health systems to which you will be supplying the products. Secondly, a compliant quality management system is geared towards reducing process issues and ensuring you supply products of the highest quality. And in my opinion, one of the other main advantages of investing in a quality management system is that it builds process redundancy, which makes it easy to capture internal know-how and provide you with the flexibility to bring in new products and also helps when there are new team members or changes within your team. And lastly, having a TGA listing along with the ISO certifications will help you to fast track regulatory approvals in number of export markets and being a medical device will allow for import tax concessions in most countries. So there are a number of other additional advantages as well. So in summary, a quality management system will play an integral part for you to achieve medical device regulatory compliance. And it is important to review the resources and support you are eligible for, like government grants and other programs in order for you to achieve this. And with that, I hope you found this session useful. As a local manufacturer, ClickSmart is always open to supporting other companies like us. And I'm sure many of you have some of the same questions we have had at some point. So our contact details are here. And if you have any questions or would like to have a chat, feel free to reach out. And I'll just try to pass it back to Shayla. Thanks so much, Sham. That was a great presentation. And I think it's also important to emphasize that when you go down the route of getting 13485 certification, it also puts you in a really good place, not just for additional regulatory approvals in other countries, but also it allows you to move from class one low risk devices into other medical devices too, if that's part of your business strategy. So Chan, before we let you go, we've just got a question um, from one of the participants. Baz is asking, in your experience for an injection molder, 
how long does it take to transfer from 9001 to 13485? Um, I think it depends on the scope of the process covered. So if, if they're already producing a final, not a component that is injection molded, but a final product where there is assembly, packaging and labeling, I think it can take about three months. But if you have to expand that from a component being manufactured to being able to assemble, package and label and distribute, I think it can go up to about six to eight months in my, this is from my experience. Yeah, that's a good point, Cham. And I think often in that transition, manufacturers, particularly in the injection molding space or in the higher volume space, yeah. they're not used to single packaging, labeling, sealing, and the requirements around that for a medical device are quite, are a lot stricter than they are yeah. defined in 9001. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. And thanks for all our speakers for sharing their insights today. Up next, we have the panel session. So if you haven't already done so, please pop your questions into the Q&A or raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question directly. Um, so I'm just going to have a look in the Q&A. Fiona and Zoe, we've got a couple of questions about export only. So can I obtain an export only certificate if my product is not on the ARTG? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, short answer is no. So we have um, categories of ARTG inclusion and one of the categories is a class one export only entry. So it, it, you need to, in order to export any therapeutic goods, you need to have at the very least an export ARTG entry as a class one export only. If you have an ARTG inclusion to supply in Australia, that's a class one inclusion, you can get a certificate of free sale or an export only certificate. You can only get an export only certificate if, sorry, you, if you only have an ARTG entry as a class one export only, you can only obtain an export only certificate. So the, it's the subtle difference between a uh, certificate of free sale and an export only. Certificate of free sale, many overseas countries recognise that if it's supplied and accepted for use within Australia, it's also used, it's also acceptable within other countries. But countries do recognise the difference between export only and certificate of free sale. Hopefully that explains it. <laughs> Thanks, Fiona. And Nick, hopefully that answered your question. If it didn't, just put a follow-up question in there as well. Um, just a few comments about uh, great insights um, on the mask because we see workplace health and safety regulations also having a role to play in the design of face masks. Um, it, for example, masks for fire smoke masks in the mining industry and headbands versus ear loops. I've had a, heard a lot of commentary around this and I think having the medical sector work with the workplace health and safety sector on the design side to understand the user needs is really important. Um, so another question we've got, and I'll just leave this open, I'll probably to, to Cham or Michelle, around, there's been a few questions around obtaining 13485 and how long does the process take? I know that's a difficult question to answer, but Cham, did you want to jump in with this followed by Fiona? Again, it is quite difficult without knowing where the starting point is. But if you are starting out from new, I would, I would estimate around nine to twelve months, um, because it does take a lot of work, um, not only to put the procedures in place, but to train and to make sure that the processes are being maintained as well. So I think. Um, if to do it properly and for the full scope of the ISO 13485 certification, I, it would take about nine to 12 months. Fiona, did you have any, not Fiona, sorry, Michelle, did you have any additional comments on that? Yeah, I also agree with Cham. It really does, as she so nicely presented, show where you're starting from. Uh, I know that Hydrix has uh, supported clients through this process ourselves and it, it does take a significant period of time really in that gap analysis primarily you know, that needs to be very thorough uh, in order to then ensure that you've got processes in place to close out those gaps and then train the relevant um, 
members of the organisation on those processes. Excellent, thanks. So we have another question on hearing views around reciprocal market certification um, and understanding what, uh, what markets to go into first. So they're asking about getting CE marking first, followed by FDA, followed by TGA, rather than TGA first. And do any of the panels have any comments on, I guess, what markets they decided to get regulatory approval in and what markets they decided to penetrate first? It really depends on, on their um, business strategy, commercial strategy. Uh, I've seen any number of organisations uh, certainly go through uh, CE mark, uh, and I'm particularly familiar in, in class three devices, but uh, uh, it, it really depends on what the commercial goals for the organisation are. Uh, certainly if you get uh, TGA approval first, that doesn't mean then that that can be used necessarily to, to get FDA approval, um, but the reverse does apply. Shay, can I add something to what Michelle said in that? Um, Europe is at the moment going through a medical device regulatory change and that makes the process quite complicated if you are a new device going into a new market. So um, it might be, if Europe is not your first consideration at this point, might be worth to wait because my understanding as a manufacturer is there's quite a long wait, especially with the notified bodies being accredited to go on to uh, look for compliance within the MDR instead of the MDD. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And the, the markets that people determine to get approval in first changes over the years. I think in, in the past, Europe was, was easier to leverage from Australia, um, but given those regulatory changes and the changes in the framework, a lot of um, manufacturers and designers are choosing to go to the US first. So it, it really depends on the product, the, the risk profile that it has and what your market strategy is. Um, thank you. Um, so just a couple of questions for our TGA folks. Um, so did Fiona say that manufacturers have to apply for market authorization before submitting to the ARTG or oh, ARTDG? Or well, if so, how long does it take for the TGA to approve the market authorization? So I'm not sure if we got that right, Fiona and Zoe, but if you could expand on that. So market authorization is an inclusion in the ARTG. Okay, so if, if you've got a COVID product, we're, we're expediting those assessments at the moment. And for class one inclusions, if we're talking about class one non-steriles, the process is a self-declaration and self followed, sorry, a self-assessment followed by that declaration that you've met all of those requirements and it, it's an administrative process. So it's very fast to get a class one non-sterile device included in the ARTG. Okay, once you've got that class one, then you can use that to support your application for a certificate of free sale. Okay, which so that's that's the certificate that says, yes, I'm supplying in Australia and I can supply overseas. So you must have an ARTG entry first. And that is market authorization is an ARTG inclusion. Thanks, Fiona. And we've just got another follow up question about ARTG listing. And I'm not sure if this is something you want to answer online or if this is something that is a bit more specific and maybe should be done through offline communication. But it says my issue is that we supply lab automation that is not applicable for the ARTG listing. But many of our overseas customers ask for a certificate of free sale. In the past, we have used the Chamber of Commerce, but many customers are wary of this approach. Something the TGA, something for, from the TGA would be more credible. I can only comment about therapeutic goods. So if you've got um, laboratory automation equipment, if it meets the definition of a medical device, then if it's laboratory equipment, it would be a class one IVD. And therefore you would, if you had a class one uh, TG entry for your IVD instruments, 
then you would be eligible for a certificate of free sale. If your laboratory automated equipment doesn't meet the definition of a therapeutic good, then you cannot get the, um, the uh, that um, certificate of free sale as a as a therapeutic good, which is what I think that you're you're looking for. Excellent, thanks, Fiona. And we've just had a poll pop up on the screen too. If you want to answer that for future future topics as well, everybody, all the participants, feel free to do that. Um, so we've just got another question from Bruce. Where a medical device designer or retailer is not the manufacturer, i.e. They, they contract it out to another manufacturer, are there clear pathways to define responsibilities under 13485? For example, a manufacturer is packaging, labelling, while the designer seller is defining purpose, post-market surveillance, etc. Or is this resolved on a case-by-case -case basis when applying for TGA approval? So we might actually just send that to, to Cham and Michelle first, because I think a manufacturer's perspective on how to break down the quality system and the various responsibilities and then spin to the TGA, because I think it's less of a TGA question and more of a manufacturer's question. Cham, did you want to start with that? Shay, can you repeat that a bit? Because I missed a little bit of it. <laughs> Oh, that's okay. It's really around. So, we, if in this situation they're describing mm -hmm. um, the medical device designer and retailer is not the manufacturer, so they've they've contracted out their manufacturing. Yeah. But so the manufacturer is responsible for the packaging and the labelling, but the designer or seller is still responsible for post market surveillance. So they have um, shared responsibility of the whole thirteen four eight five system. And uh, so I think it depends on who's branding this device as a legal manufacturer and who's acting as the sponsor. Um, because first, as, as required by the TGA, you have to clearly identify who is the manufacturer of the device in terms of uh, um, the responsibilities around the performance of the device. And I think as if you are the sponsor, in this case, the distributor, um, there are, there are some post-market surveillance responsibilities, but the manufacturer is ultimately responsible for the performance of the device. And from an ISO 13485 uh, point of view, you can define the scope that you are responsible for. Are you responsible for manufacturing? Are you responsible for design? And are you responsible for um, um, the distribution of medical devices? So as one of the components in that, um, in that supply chain, essentially, you have to work with the other suppliers in that supply chain to make sure they are compliant as well, if you are the, if you are the person who's going to label the device. Because that responsibility of functionality and performance, I think, falls under the person who labels them under their brand. Thanks, Chan. Michelle, did you have anything to add? Yeah, that was very much my thoughts too. And and often it, we've worked with clients too that, you know, struggle a little bit. I'm only distributing the device. You know, do I need to be um, 13485 compliant as well? Um, and to Cham's point, if you are not in any way um, prescribing the intended use of the device, if you're not altering the labelling of the device, uh, then as the distributor, um, those responsibilities uh, fall back on the, the legal manufacturer. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Fiona, Zoe, did you have anything to add to that? Defining the sponsor and their requirements compared to the manufacturer and their requirements um, and their responsibilities. And a manufacturer doesn't actually physically have to do all of the manufacturing steps or all of the um, steps within 13485, for example. But if they are outsourcing any of that activity per 13485 requirements, they need to have stringent supply control processes in place and controls in place. Um, uh, yeah, so it's about defining who is that legal manufacturer, that term that gets bandied about, um, and they have that full responsibility of all of those 13485 requirements um, compared to sponsor requirements. Yeah, 
Thanks, Ali. And I, I think that's a really good point. And also, when you understand who the legal manufacturer is and the sponsor is, then you can design the 13485 framework around that. And perhaps if there's a lot of contracted out activities, you might contract out design, you might contract out manufacturer, you might even contract out post-market surveillance. That would be unusual, but you might. So the, the focus on your quality system would really be around the supplier requirements and how you manage the quality control of the manufacturer and the ongoing um, supplier arrangements there. So the, each, each quality system can be different depending on the focus of, of the person obtaining that certification. And it is quite a flexible system and you can get certification in all of the areas or you might not have certification under 13485 as a manufacturer, for instance. Excellent. So we've got just a question. This is probably a little bit out of scope, um, but and I think this is a good thought if there's more um, people that want to know about class three devices. But the question is, does anyone have any experience in getting class three IVD TGA approvals in particular or oh, in vitro diagnostics, which is IVD? Um, anything we need to know above and beyond the class one information provided today? So I think every classes, um, where to start? Fiona, did you want to start with um, a high level summary of class one to class three? Yeah. So class three IVDs is, is the second highest. So IVDs are, are separated into four risk classifications. So class three is the second from the highest. So you need to split it up into QMS certification and product assessment. So the QMS assessment is what we're talking about around meeting the requirements of ISO 13485. And I mentioned before about accepting comparable overseas regulators' evidence of conformity assessment. So if you've got a CE mark as a class three, and this is talking about the new requirements which we've mentioned before are coming in in Europe within the next couple of years under the IVD regulations. Um, if, if you've already got product that's supplied and CE marked, um, in Europe, or if you have a Health Canada um, certificate, then you can use that QMS certification and evidence of product assessment to allow you to apply for inclusion directly in the ARTG. If you don't have the QMS certification, then you need to go through the whole conformity assessment process um, by the TGA. So the TGA does, it's, it's split into two areas, QMS and product assessment. And we will accept what is available from comparable overseas regulators, either one or both of them. So it, it, without going into a lot more detail, it's, it's a challenge, but um, if you, there is quite a lot of information in the, on the website under the IVD section if, if you want to, to go through. Thanks, Fiona. We might leave that question there because uh, the higher risk class classification of devices is a massive topic that we could spend hours talking on. So we've got a couple of minutes and I just wanted to run through some feedback that we've received throughout the session. So just it would be useful to have presentations reflect um, capital and compliance cost and the timelines and realities for SMEs. So I think what you're talking about there is really the practical what does it actually take to do this? And, and that's, that's really good feedback. Um, and particularly in the pandemic context, that requires speed to market. I think it really is always a challenge between speed to market and managing the risk associated with medical devices. And the, the risk that is inherent in any medical device is the reason that these systems and processes are, are in place. They're to protect our, our community and, and our healthcare workers that are using these products. Um, and how can SMEs be supported to get through this process faster, to get a product to market without going out of business thanks to the hurdle of costs? So I think that's really good feedback, looking at the more practical element of cost of capital, cost of compliance and timeframes and realities for compliance as well. And um, we've also got some feedback that we'd love to see a topic about innovative devices and how to approach the clinical case process when you can't just slot into a current standard and demonstrate that you meet it. And I think that's really good feedback as well. It is challenging when you are looking at a disruptive device or something that is in fact novel and the path to market can be quite challenging because there's not a set of standards that you can follow to achieve it. 
Excellent. I think that's it for all the questions today. It's 12.29 and we're almost out of time. But I just wanted to give a really big thanks to all of our panelists today for giving their time so generously. We're so appreciative of having the industry representation as well as our regulators here today. And thank you to LSQ and MTP Connect for supporting this session today and the, their partners, the Queensland Government. So thank you everybody and I hope we provided some clarity around class one medical devices. Um, the presentations will be available shortly on the LSQ website and I encourage you to, to seek further clarification with our panelists today if you'd like to. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.